All right, we're going to continue our uh, message time a little bit different here this morning. Um, and if, uh, if you're comfortable, there are uh, my helpers um, handing out mints. And uh, so if you've got bad breath, now I, want, I guess is an opportunity to say, yes, I'll take one of those. Um, but as we continue our conversation <coughs> about money matters, uh, I have uh, here with me Raleigh Hutton. Many of you know Raleigh and his wife, Suzette. They're members here at the Ord Christian Church. But he also works for a company called the Solomon Foundation. And uh, we'll get into all of that for a little bit. But that company itself, the, the beginnings of it, has a great uh, testament, I believe. Uh, and so you're getting mints because I believe uh, as they proclaim uh, the testament of, of God, what God has laid upon their heart to do, that maybe it'll also inspire us to remember that as we think about our financial matters, uh, the way that we um, organize our lives in all ways and especially financial ways, you'll remember maybe every time you get a mint that, uh, well, even in my money, there is a way to be a testament uh, to others and uh, how we glorify God. So uh, that's a, a little bit of your intro. You're, you're welcome to the, to the mints. Now, I think there'll be some even left over if you decide later, may, maybe not, a couple? A couple, that's all right. Um, and if you're joining us online, well, I guess you'll have to stop by later for a mint or go get your own. Um, or maybe you'll just remember that someday when you take a mint, that your financial matters even uh, as a way to be a testament to others. So, um, Raleigh, how's it going? It's going really well. It's going really well. I enjoyed watching Tanner throw those mints around to his kids. That was good. Yeah. <clears throat> that, would, that would be someday. Anybody got a potato gun? Yeah. <laughs> One person, uh, maybe. Yeah. We we'll get a potato gun in here and we'll launch out some stuff. We'll have to turn the volume down or the, the pressure down quite a ways. We'll be spackling the ceilings with uh, chocolate and Skittles. Yeah. It'd be a very colorful day, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, just a little bit. Uh, so, Raleigh, can you give us just a little bit of background? Maybe you've shared this, but tell me, uh, tell us about your life experiences, uh, ministry experiences, and how you've got to, to this place today. All right. Well, first of all, Suzette is not with me today, but uh, she wanted to convey her greetings to everybody as well. And I just want you to know how grateful we are to be a part of the Ord Christian Church. And every time we go home, I, literally, I talk about Doug's sermons. He's a good preacher. I love his family. I love the leadership that you have here at Ord. And uh, one of the things that's taken place in my job right now is I have a 10-state area that I cover. So I cover a lot of real estate. I'm in different churches every Sunday morning. And I just want to share with you that I'm very grateful for the unity that's at the Ord Christian Church. I love seeing these little kids running everywhere. And more and more, I'm convinced, as you and I go through this craziness called 2020 and the COVID and the racial strife and all that's going on, it's going to be more and more important for you and me to, to maintain unity. And we've got to trust our leadership. And I appreciate the way the leadership at Ord Christian has taken everything into consideration. They're moving ahead with different things. But uh, can I just share with you, now's not the time to go rogue. N now is the time for us to stay unified. And uh, I, I kid you not, Suzette and I were just in Eugene, Oregon. Um, our kids go to a church that's been around forever. And uh, it's a mess because uh, they're not dividing over doctrinal issues. It's over personal opinion. And so I just want to encourage you to just spend some time in John 17. You know, it's the Lord's Prayer for unity for the church. Uh, we've got to trust the leadership as we move forward. Uh, this congregation, uh, I know Eddie's not here, but um, his dad had a super impact on my wife's family. So I am eternally grateful for what this church has done uh, for the kingdom. And Suzette and I are grateful to be a part of it. I Doug didn't ask me to give that, but I just wanted to share it. Uh, I, I was a preacher for 37 years, 
And to be honest with you, I kind of got to a point in my life where I was starting to feel like my effectiveness was starting to wane a little bit. And I didn't want to look out the window on a Sunday morning and see the uh, ambulance backed up to take me to the care center and I not know that it had gotten that bad. And so about that time, Doug Crozier, who is from Parker, Colorado, uh, called me and just said, hey, let's, uh, let's sit down and talk about coming to work for the Solomon Foundation. And I was a part of the Nexus New Church Planning Group. We were the ones that helped get uh, Columbus going and also the one in Hastings. And so I met with Doug in Parker. And uh, about halfway through the conversation, he asked me if the elders at Kingsway knew what was going on. And I let him know that two of the elders were praying for this uh, job interview as we spoke. And I think that uh, was enough for Doug. And he leaned in and said, so do you want to come to work for the Solomon Foundation? I said, I probably better talk to my wife about this one. So Suzette and I talked it over. And to be honest with you, the uh, tipping point, two, two things actually. I've had a heart for racial reconciliation since 1980, and if you ever want to hear that story, uh, I'll, I'll be glad to share it with you, but the Solomon Foundation, uh, we have come alongside the African American Churches of Christ in America. Uh, if there's other groups doing it, I don't know about it, but we've committed about $80 million to help the African American Churches of Christ, Christian churches, and when I heard that, and the heart that Doug had for uh, racial reconciliation, I knew it was him. But then the second thing is uh, we could live anywhere in our region where we wanted to. So uh, we moved back uh, to Burwell, or actually we live halfway between Burwell and Erickson, and we love it. Love being close to Suzette's mom, love being a part of this church. Um, so that's kind of what got me to where I'm at today, Doug, in a, in a nutshell. Yeah, thanks. That's it. Uh, you know, everybody has a story. Uh, everybody has different steps in their lives that leads them to where they're at today. And I think it's good to go back and reflect <clears throat> from time to time and say, how did I get here? And especially as we think about money matters, we've talked about, you know, waking <clears throat> up someday and thinking, how did I get here? A and every decision and every step has a, a myriad of options. And so um, it's important to think not only in our <clears throat> money matters, how did I get here? But then also in relational things, how did I get here? As a church, how did I get here? How did we get to where we're at? And sometimes those are great things, and sometimes those are challenging things, and it requires some really hard questions for us to look in the mirror and answer. But uh, I just want to encourage you at some point in time to look back in, in your story and reflect, and then also worship and, and praise God for those challenges. Um, and then, then we can look to the future, but it requires us to look back first. Um, Anything fun you want to share? Do you have a joke you want to tell us or anything? Uh, Just you know, you caught me off guard on a joke. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but Every I, good preacher has a five-minute story to introduce. <laughs> and, uh, well, I, I or can, or I can, just anything fun. Yeah, I can tell you this part moving forward. I, I enjoy visiting about finances. And I'm sure Doug is bringing this up in some of his sermons. But Jesus talked more about finances than any other subject in the Gospels. And this past week, uh, Marshall and Cindy know who I'm talking about. I was back in uh, Scotts Bluff, Nebraska for Shane Coop's funeral. And um, Shane was an intern of mine when I lived in Huron, South Dakota. And there was a lady in the church. Her name was Judy Helseth. That was Shane's aunt. And Judy was feisty, to say the least. I mean, she was a firecracker. She worked for Sears, sold carpet, and was very good at it. And anytime I would preach on giving, and without exception, Judy would come up and say, remember, you're never going to offend those who tithe when you speak about giving, because they already get it. It's the ones who aren't tithing that you need to come alongside of. And uh, one of the great things about my wife, <clears throat> and I tell people, you know, that the key to being a good preacher is 98% you marry the right woman and 2% you steal the right material. So I, I, I did that uh, in both cases, actually. 
But when we first got married, we lived in Brookings, South Dakota, and we were so poor we couldn't even pay attention. I mean, we were poor. <clears throat> and the church there paid us 125 bucks a week. We lived in this old parsonage. A and I kid you not, we could lay in bed at night and hear the attic door whip in the wind. I mean, they thought they were really doing us a favor by letting us stay in this parsonage. And the furnace never shut off from November until probably April 15th. I mean, it, it just didn't keep us warm. But we decided early, uh, we're going to trust God and tithe. And so both of us were in full agreement on that. And it's, it's the only thing in the, in the Bible where God says, trust me on this. And I know a lot of times preachers will say, and, and most of us know this, but let me just back the train up a little bit. A tithe is 10%. And in the Old Testament, God asked the nation of Israel to give a tithe, and then actually there to give a second tithe, which was an offering. And then once every three years, they took up another tithe just for the celebrations. I, I, and and I, I've never heard pre Doug preach on this, so I hope I'm not it's going too week. far into this. But I know there are some preachers that say you need to, to gradually work to the tithe. I, I don't believe that. I, I, I think if 2020 taught us anything, it teaches us to trust God. And God says, trust me in this. And if you're here today and you, you've not trusted God, and you're thinking, well, I'll give him 3%, and the next year I'll give him 5%. That's really not what God wants. Uh, let, let me give you an example. Let's say that one of Tanner's employees comes to him and says, you know, Tanner, I, I've been stealing stuff. And uh, probably about three days a week, I, you know, steal some shingles, and I steal some, you know, hardware, and I steal some tools. But I'm going to cut back to two days a week. <laughs> <laughs> So what would, what would Tanner say, hey, you're doing well. Let's keep you around for the next five to ten years, see if you can get better at this. You know, or Kylie, I, I didn't see Kylie here this morning, but if someone came to the grocery store and said, hey, Kylie, I just want to confess, I, I come in four days a week and I shoplift, but good news, I'm, I'm cutting back. I'm, I'm going to cut back to three days a week. We, we would not accept that, Right? We, we understand that. I mean, it's just basic. And so God says, test me in this. Malachi said, who would rob God? And so I, if 2020 has taught me anything, it, it's taught me we've got we've to trust an unknown future to a God that we can trust. Yeah. That Great. wasn't a funny so story, but that was... Yeah, next <clears throat> week um, we're just going to stay at home because that's next week's sermon. <clears throat> yeah. Um, now, and Kylie, he, uh, for those of you who don't know, he broke his ankle. He's joining us online, to my knowledge. <clears throat> oh. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's a, it's, a, it's a good principle. And as we think just through the accounts of Scripture, the history of Scripture, what he's told us, those things are all uh, accurate. Um, Thinking through the story of Sol Solomon Foundation and why we're talking about that today and, and the Testament, can you tell me about Solomon Foundation's beginning before we dive a little bit further as to why we're okay. uh, talking about them today? So I work with the Solomon Foundation. We were established in 2011. Doug Crozier is our CEO. I, I love working with Doug. He's very aggressive. He, um, he has a heart for the restoration movement, just as a side note. If you're uh, using the Christian standard and the lookout, uh, the standard and the lookout were about to go under. And because Doug is so restoration movement minded, we bought the lookout and the standard. And we make that available for free online. Because if any of you are in business or any kind of publication, you know that the cost is in the publication and the mailing. It's it's. Some cost in development, but really it's in the uh, publication and mailing. So we make that available for free to anybody who wants it. And we're hoping it'll all be advertiser driven and then eventually we'll, we'll sell it. But the Solomon Foundation basically does two things. We come alongside churches and help them go to the next level. Quite often that means uh, helping them with a loan and then we provide leadership development, leadership training, and then we encourage the preachers as much as we can. 
And then the second thing is uh, we come alongside churches like this, and if people want to invest with the Solomon Foundation, really our product pretty well takes care of itself. Uh, you can earn up to 4.65% guaranteed on your money, and all that money stays in the restoration movement. It's all independent Christian churches, churches of Christ, and we've helped a little over 300 churches go to the next level. So uh, that's really what the Solomon Foundation does. Uh, we're the fastest growing church extension fund in America. We just topped 700 million uh, three weeks ago. Um, a lot of people love what, what they're seeing and they love the stability of their uh, return. Yeah, yeah. so the Christian Standard, um, we have um, provided in the past paper copies for that. Many of you have enjoyed that resource. Uh, we do have uh, the print version. It is a month behind. the, So if you order and you can purchase it still online yourself individually and get it in the mail, <coughs> the digital version comes out like week to week to week in kind of a newsletter format. Um, and then they put it all together in one kind of mass booklet form in a digital print. And then that comes out free. And so we make that available to you. Just We've been encouraging that over this last year to get plugged in there. Lots of resources great resources. We could spend hours talking about just uh, the significance there and the richness that that resource can give. Um, and then we do have print. If you want a print copy, we have said we'll go ahead and download the print and print it for you if you really uh, said that's that's what I want. I just want the print and I'm not going to pay for it. So um, we're, we're trying to make that resource still available to you. And uh, um, But I encourage you to get the newsletter uh, on your on your own newsletter uh, email list. Also, the lookout, if you're on Facebook, you can see we've been following their yearly Bible plan every day. There's a reading that comes out, so you can plug in there. It's one of the ways that we can uh, continue to stay connected to God's Word uh, and also maybe even be on the same page, so to speak, that unity factor. That's just one of the ways that you can do that. Um, so I've, I've greatly appreciated the Solomon Foundation and the content they are sharing not only in that way, but also they sponsor a number of different conferences that I've been mm -hmm. to. Uh, different different area churches have brought in leadership, and, and Solomon Foundation have helped aid in that to happen. And so uh, Kurt and I went to a conference over a year ago now in Grand Island, and uh, it was a fantastic time of being encouraged and being challenged. And so the Solomon Foundation has helped made that. Uh, what would you say um, as some of the biggest either highlight and or challenges that uh, maybe both that Solomon's had to face in 2020. I mean, they're just the same yeah. as everybody else. They've faced some good things and some yeah. challenging things this year. Yeah. So for me, one of the biggest wins this past year is I work with a church in Wichita, and it's a smaller congregation, and they uh, it, it's going to sound like I'm setting you up for a joke, but I'm, I'm really not. But a Jewish synagogue came up for sale. And it was going to be a um, um, sealed bid process. And so, you know, no offense to Doug. Doug would be an anomaly to a lot of preachers because I think Doug understands finances. He understands, uh, I think those who grew up in a rural area, they understand more. But most of us preachers are clueless when it comes to finances. I'm just going to tell it like it is, clueless. And so the preacher in Wichita really didn't have any idea of what, and because it's a sealed bid, you know, you, you want to make sure that you bid high enough that you get it, but not so high that you look foolish that you've outbid the next guy by 300000 So we have two guys on staff, Bill and Tom. They looked over the property. They made a suggestion. But the part that really kind of put this thing over the top was our CEO, Doug, has a plan that what we did is we went in and we made a cash offer on the Jewish synagogue. So we took our, at that time, $650, $650 million spreadsheet, said we're going to buy the synagogue and then immediately turn around and sell it to this church. So to make a long story short, uh, the church was outbid by about 150000 But the Jewish synagogue saw that it was a clean bid from the Solomon Foundation, it was a cash bid, so they were willing to take $150,000 less and sell it to the church. 
And so this congregation got into a building for about 675000 It's a turnkey operation. Everything is, uh, you know, the Jewish synagogue took amazing care of this property. So they didn't have to go in and remodel anything. They didn't have to go in. Basically, they just take down some Jewish or some Hebrew writings off the wall. But it, it's a turnkey operation. And I don't think that ever would have happened if the Solomon Foundation had not come alongside of them and got creative and said, let us buy it. We'll turn around and sell it to the church. And so Suzette and I will be there uh, the week before Christmas because the second thing they did is they let the Jewish synagogue know you can stay in here, do a couple of uh, special events uh, to close out the year. And they let them stay in over the summer and the fall. And that's just one way that um, I think that the Solomon Foundation can help churches because, like I said, I don't think they would have got that property if it would have been comparing apples to apples. I think they would have gone with the high bid. Now, the challenging part, as most of you know, uh, I am Zoomed out. I'm not a Zoom guy. I, I don't like Zoom meetings. I like to meet John for coffee and talk across the table. I, I just don't do Zoom very well, but it's a necessary, I almost said evil, but that's not true. It's a necessary part of our job. And so uh, one of the things that Solomon does when, whenever a church takes out a loan with us, they have to have three months in reserve. Because those of us who live in rural areas and we live north, we know there's going to be at least one Sunday this winter where the snow's going to hit, the wind's going to blow, and we probably won't be able to meet. Uh, once again, a lot of preachers, Doug, Doug would not be, fall into this category, but a lot of preachers don't think about that. So the Solomon Foundation requires that every church keep a three-month reserve, and that's helped us get through this whole 2020 covid uh, a lot of the church has been very grateful that they've had a savings account to fall back on. And so uh, at this point, 95% uh, of the churches, we've helped over 300, have made all of their loans. Uh, we've got a couple of them that are, uh, we've been able to um, do a six-month extension on their loans. And then a couple of them are a couple months behind. <clears throat> but once again, uh, our, our CEO, Doug, and our management team, they stay in close contact with our churches and they help them uh, navigate through this season. So uh, COVID has been hard on us. We were supposed to have a staff meeting in Denver that we all look forward to coming back because there's seven guys like me in the field, everywhere from the East Coast to the West Coast. It's really the only time of the year we get together to just enjoy one another's companies and uh, that's going to be a zoom meeting so pretty bummed about that but that's the way it is yeah first world <coughs> problem mm -hmm. yeah yeah over if you've been with <coughs> us the last number of weeks we've talked um just about how uh everything we have is god's it's not ours and yet it's ours and so develop a plan that's important um a budget or a spending plan and then we've talked about the Im impact of debt and how that's something that God really doesn't want us to be in. He doesn't desire for us to live in that. And so last week we talked about savings. And so just being reminded that Solomon, is, um, as I look through and as I visited with individuals that I know connected with Solomon, everything is founded upon God's word as a principle. And I think that's important. If we're going to have a testament, uh, a testimony that our lives are guided by God's word. And it's important for that to be central. And so I'm encouraged to hear also that Solomon Foundation is encouraging their churches not just to adhere biblically to theological, what we would consider maybe spiritual matters, but also in practice, some practical financial mm -hmm. matters and, and wise uh, planning uh, financially. So uh, that's why I'm encouraged to know Solomon Foundation, to, to share uh, Solomon Foundation with you, and then also to be challenged by them as we uh, watch their testimony. Um, what, uh, anything, uh, I guess, significant that uh, you would say 
we talked about, we've already talked about churches, how you come across, um, come along churches. And so that was, <clears throat> we've kind of, we've bounced around a little bit. Um, anything else that maybe you feel like is important for us to know as to why Solomon Foundation or just the impact that Solomon Foundation has made specifically for the churches that we haven't talked about? So uh, I talked earlier about that, you know, the two things that really was a tipping point for me personally. One was the whole racial reconciliation. And Suzette and I have had opportunity to be in some African-American churches of Christ. Uh, we're all friends here, so keep that in mind as I tell you this story. So Suzette and I walk in, and literally we're the only Caucasians there. So the preacher said, hey, we've got a couple of guests today. I'm going to see if we can point them out to you. And I'm thinking, point them out to me. <laughs> uh, I think it was pretty obvious when we walked in. <clears throat> but then the, the second part of what we do, and, and once again, I'm going to call on one of your elders here. If I start getting too close to the line, he's going to go like this. I, I think we've got to be really open about where we invest our money. <clears throat> because there, there are places where you and I can invest our money and the investments that we make are going towards things that you and I don't agree in, agree with as Christians. And uh, I'm going to share briefly, Suzette and I lived in Omaha and th this is all public knowledge because Warren Buffett owns the, the Omaha paper once a month, they would have the Warren Watch. One Sunday, they, they had an article about his daughter, Susan Buffett. And I, I can guarantee you that if you're for it, she's against it. Now, this is, in, it was in the paper. So, uh, and probably the one that I thought of the most was, uh, there was in Texas, they, they passed a very pro-family, pro-life bill in the state legislature. She was the one who hired the lawyers to help overturn that uh, law in Texas. Now I say that as somewhat of a negative, but let me give you the positive. Uh, the one thing that we keep track of at the Solomon Foundation is all the churches we've helped, they send in a report every year on the number of people that have been baptized into Christ. And as of recent, the churches we've helped have had 25,000 baptisms. So that's what gets me up in the morning. That, that's what keeps me focused on what I do, is I know that we're advancing the cause of Christ. And I'm 59, and I feel like my wife and I get to be a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. Uh, you know, you would probably recognize some of the board directors, uh, Barry Cameron, who has done the ABCs of financial freedom. Uh, Don Wilson started Christ Church of the Valley, a little church of about 35,000 in the Phoenix area. He's one of our board members. And uh, another thing I, I love about Solomon is uh, there's, there's three groups within our brotherhood, all of them good groups that do the same thing that we do. But one thing that we do that's different is we make it available for everybody uh, to invest. And uh, Suzette and I are big fans of Dave Ramsey. Uh, we're not followers, we're fans of Dave Ramsey. And so, you know, he talks about having a six month reserve. So Suzette and I put our six month reserve with the Solomon Foundation, we make 2.25%. So even uh, a, an initial investment of $250 is all it takes with the Solomon Foundation. So you can do a, a, a on-demand account. It's like having a passbook savings where you just put your money in. You can have access to it at any time, six month, one year, three year, and five year. But I feel like I get to be a part of something far bigger than myself. Yeah. Churches, um, at, just in case you're uh, unaware, we have uh, put uh, money into an account with Solomon Foundation. Uh, many of you know the, the background story to that. If you're not familiar with that and where that came from, we'd be happy to share a faithful, faithful lady 
um, gave generously to the church through her life estate planning, and it has uh, largely sat, we, we immediately gave it to our missions, uh, dispersed it out, and then largely it has just kind of sat there waiting for us to continue to use and put to good use, and we've prayed and agreed and disagreed on how to best use that, but currently uh, that money is sitting in Solomon Foundation earning an interest, and it's, and it's earning a very good uh, rate for us. It's, it's, um, it's doing something significant, I think, uh, in a lot of ways, and we feel good about that as a church, as a leadership, because we know that it's going to contribute not just to some bank account somewhere, not just to our pocketbooks, but it's actually making an internal uh, significance. And so churches all across the, the country are able to do that. And if I know there are a few individuals I know personally that also invest uh, with Solomon Foundation mm -hmm. for that reason. And so um, a little bit, I guess, of a commercial would be that if you have uh, money that you're trying to figure out what to do with, you're trying to steward it well, and, and you have uh, you want to maybe, maybe you've got it all set up and you want to investigate what would it look like to move um, this resource that I've been funding over here because that's what I was taught and that's what I set up at one time. And you want to look at, well, how can I use that and still have that available, but also make it a kingdom purpose filled uh, venture also. Um, I'd encourage you to talk to, to Raleigh and, and uh, they'll put you, he'll put you in contact with somebody who really knows the financial numbers and the significance uh, to that. But I do believe it's important that as a, as a church and as individuals, we look at God's word and we profess and we say that we believe God's word to be truly inspired and the guidance for our life. And, and so there's a lot of great efforts out there, and yet there's so many things that still try to vie for our attention. And we look at them and we say, well, that's a, that's a really good thing. Uh, that that sounds good, and I want to be I want to be part of that. But in everything, there's always a is there a better? Is there a better? And and you might look at this even uh, through the lens of of mission trips. Okay, it might be a good thing to go and and uh, put a well down in some village somewhere. But is there also like with the Solomon Foundation? Is there a restoration movement? Uh, a, a body of believers who believe and adhere to the same core values that that we ourselves believe as, as individuals and as a church, uh, and how do we best use our resources together to advance the gospel as we understand it. And I think that is an important challenge uh, for us as we think about not just financial things, but also uh, spiritual things and, and eternal things. So uh, anything else individually for us to challenge us with or consider um, this morning about the Solomon Foundation that you'd have for us, Raleigh? Uh, you know... Probably the one, I'm, I'm going to tell one more story, uh, really on the racial reconciliation. You know, I was born and raised in Montana, <clears throat> right on the Canadian border. And so uh, my wife says, I got to come up with a better way of saying this, but I was pretty white and tight. You know, I, I really didn't understand. And, you know, Suzette grew up uh, in the Burwell area. And, and we don't really even understand. And uh, one of the churches that we helped is actually the largest Church of Christ in America. They run about 1,200 African-American Church of Christ. Orpheus Hayward is the preacher. And Doug Crozier tells about they, they preach or have a building in the rural Atlanta area. And he said he went to uh, the elders meeting and here was a church that had bought some land. They had 600,000 in the bank uh, they ran about 1,200, and they couldn't get a bank to even look at them, to even consider them. And finally, after about maybe 45 minutes, Doug Crozier just looked across at the chairman of the elders and said, is it because you're black? And they just all had to go like this. See, it's hard for me to fathom that that still exists because... You know, one, my, my dad was uh, very welcoming to everybody. Both my parents were. I mean, we the coffee pot was on all the time, and it didn't matter. You know, it didn't matter your social status, didn't matter your skin color. We we had people coming to our house all the time. So it's hard for me to, to really fathom that that still exists. 
And when Doug saw that, um, we came alongside of that church, and they they built a you know a new facility. Went from 1,200 to 1,800. Uh, Orpheus is one of our uh, you know key individuals within that. So so once again. Um, I, I think you and I have got to always keep in mind eternity is at stake. And people who don't know Jesus, when they breathe their last, they go to hell if they don't know Christ. And it's so easy for us to get kind of uh, complacent or uh, frustrated during this whole COVID and that type of thing. And, and we've got to keep in mind that eternity is at stake and that everything that you and I do is to help people come to get to know Jesus and then help him get to know him better. So uh, once again, if uh, there's anything I can do, let me know. But uh, my wife and I love being a part of the Org Christian Church and uh, love what you're doing. So. I have a, a one passage of scripture that I want to. I want you to maybe just read through this week, um, maybe multiple times. And I've already read the first part of this uh, in, a, in the last few weeks, but it's First Timothy chapter six, and the the verse I've already read is verse seventeen, and it says this: As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So do you remember, if you were here, do you remember that verse yet? We talked about the enjoyment God uh, has given and blessed people with riches, even abundantly. But there's a challenge in there, not to be haughty or prideful or put their trust in that rich. Uh, we are still to put our trust in God. And that can be a challenge when we start to think, well, I'm okay, I'm secure. Now, the continuation of that verse is the challenge that I really want us to think about with eternity is at stake because uh, the following verses in verses 18 to 19 you've heard this a lot this year but they stop at these first few words it says they are to do good i i have lost count of how many times i've heard the 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 tagline across a commercial or in some mission effort or in some effort to help your neighbor especially <clears throat> in 2020 do good just do good, do good. I mean, over and over. That's a great thing, right? Who doesn't want to do good? Everybody wants to do good. Everybody should be challenged to do good. But, well, they never really define what good is. <laughs> and they don't have a foundation for good. It's our own little morality or our own ideas about what good is. And yet God has really defined for us what good is. And that should be our foundation for what good is. And so this is how uh, Paul continues that, that verse in the challenge to do good. And, and as we think about our financial matters and where it's invested and what we're saving for and what we're using it for, I do want to challenge you to do good, um, to be, as it continues, to be rich in good works, to be generous mm -hmm. and ready to share. So all those things are great. And anybody can do those, whether you know Jesus or not. Our culture wants to, us to do that and, and just to encourage it. And they'll even use the scriptures to tell us with, you know, their own definition at work. Thus, storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future. Now, again, so far we're talking about the future. We all want a good future. We all want a, a happy future. We want our neighbors and our friends and our kids to have a future. Now, what does that future look like or what is defining it or why? You know, that's important for us to really think through. Again, all great things, but so far we haven't really gotten into the meat of it yet. Storing up for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Now, the concept and the background to all of this is a life in Jesus, a life in Christ, eternity. As, as he mentioned, eternity is at stake. And to take up life, which is truly life, as we study the scriptures, the interpretation of that, it ties us back to a life of eternity in Christ, with him, as opposed to apart from him, and the life that we just want to live here into retirement and blissfulness, okay? And so this is a challenge. As we think about the financial matters, the, the money matters, 
it matters not just so that we enjoy and have a a nice account and comfort level and people look at us as people who do good and and are kind and generous and are, are willing to share but what is the purpose behind that what is the foundation behind that and as a follower of christ we have a testimony that i think points to something far greater than our own generosity and our own self the the testimony that we want to proclaim is the foundation that god has laid for us And we're not storing up treasures here on earth. We're storing up treasures in heaven. And and we're not doing good works just so we can be kind and and people can can have their needs met on a physical level. But because we believe that what uh, actions we take and even the controlling of our finances or the stewarding of our finances leads them to understand life that is truly life here on earth uh, in God's perspective, but also the life that is truly life in eternity. That's why we live and move and breathe and why we talk about financial matters. And that's why uh, I encourage you to look at resources that have a scriptural foundation on how to manage your finances. And one of the ways uh, the Solomon Foundation is, I think, a great uh, testimony of that. Um, there are people who love God. They, they are trying to apply God's principles to life and also financial matters. And when we... Um, look at their ventures, their actions. We see that they're doing good works, coming alongside churches, making a difference uh, in communities in the temporal here, yes, but also in eternity. And uh, I don't know, you know, what your financial status is, but I do want to encourage you to use your resources and to multiply your resources in a way that is partnering with an eternal perspective, an eternal perspective. And we can all invest downtown at the bank or with, you know, some mutual fund that, you know, helps Procter & Gamble's bottom line. And we can all do that. That's easy. But if we can do the same thing and help plant churches, uh, help expand churches' ministries, help lead to over 25,000 baptisms uh, where people are taking up life, which is truly life, I just want to encourage you to lean into that and, and see how maybe God is leading your heart. I'm not... This is, this is our, uh, I guess, advertisement, for, so to speak. Just um, if you have any questions about the Solomon Foundation and, and uh, maybe the options that are available for you, um, I know they'd be happy to visit with you. And uh, if there's other elements, you know, like financial planning, estate planning, there's other organizations that do that, we'd be happy to share and point you in those directions because Solomon Foundation is not the only um, organization that, that does this. But I really appreciate their adherence to the church, uh, especially the restoration movement, and uh, propping up the church and helping to encourage the church and doing things uh, collectively together to support the church where the church would be like, there's no way to accomplish this. And yet we can see God moving uh, in a picture that is far greater than ourselves, far greater than that individual church. Um, But I just want to challenge you this week, uh, how's God leading you and moving you? to do good, to be generous, to share, um, so that others can take up life that is truly life. That's, that's your challenge. Um, anything else you want to add? Nope, other than I have got a lot of pens, because I haven't <laughs> been able to travel a lot, so <laughs> take a lot of pens for your dad today, okay? You can so throw So seriously, if you, uh, <laughs> if you find yourself homeschooling because of all the COVID or anything, you just grab a handful of pens, because I'm tired of... Uh, carrying around and you can never have too many pens in your pickup that's what i figured out so yeah now if you have uh, any uh at the end of our time here maybe something struck a chord with you and you want to just visit with either myself or raleigh about something uh, we want to make that invitation to you um it's not a highly evangelistic message except for the fact that uh, the reason why we exist as a church is so that we can gather as the body of christ and we're doing that here today and the reason why we exist is so as a church, we can grow in our relationship with Christ uh, so that we can go with the gospel of Christ. And, and if you don't know what that means or what the gospel of Christ is, you've never accepted that, we want to have a conversation with you. We want to start that conversation. We want to study the scriptures with you. Um, but here today, I don't know what your prayer need is. Maybe it's something of a health need or a financial need or, or maybe it's for someone else uh, to come to know Jesus and you're praying with them. You want to do that with someone, we make that invitation uh, here after uh, after I pray. 
But I pray that first and foremost, as you leave this place, as you go with the gospel of Christ, um, you're able to be a good testimony. And the next time you take a mint, may you uh, just remember that we're all a testament of God's work and the work that he wants to do. Uh, so let's, uh, let's pray, and then whatever decision you need to make or conversation you want to enter, I want to encourage that. Uh, Lord, thank you just for this time that we've had to uh, just be together as the body of Christ, uh, to learn about um, an organization that deals in finances, uh, something that sometimes we kind of shy away from as a, as a non-spiritual matter, but yet uh, you've made it clear over and over again, especially as much as you talk about it in your word, uh, that it's a, it's a big deal. And, and so, Lord, I just pray that uh, there's something here that uh, we can take as a step. Uh, maybe, it's a, maybe it's some issue of, of racial recognition uh, and, and reconciliation that we need to make. Um, that's something that you, you pricked our hearts on, and we need to just uh, look at your perspective on that. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's something with a savings plan or just um, a, a making some type of investment. Maybe we've got uh, something set up, and we're building somebody else's account uh, somewhere else, really, and it's not having an eternal effect. And so you're leading us to take that step. I pray that you just give us the um, wherewithal to, to explore that option and really, truly lean into what you'd have us do. Uh, maybe it's just the, the things that we need to evaluate in our lives and say, where, where have I come alongside other organizations or other people and, and to what end uh, and the why is behind it? Give us, a, give us a, a season to just evaluate and look back at our story and uh, be reminded of, of the steps that we've taken to where we are right now today and uh, give us just a glimpse of, of the future that you would have for us. Uh, the life uh, here on earth, but also the life which is truly life, um, give us that perspective in all matters. And so, Lord, I just thank you for each person here and each person who's been able to watch, uh, join us online. Um, again, just do a work as only you can do a work and lead us to glorify you in every way. And this we pray in Jesus' name.